Welcome to the first APF webinar on new directions in pulmonary fibrosis research. My name is Steve Jones and I'm the chair of Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis. Over the last 10 years, there's been a massive growth in research on pulmonary fibrosis, especially on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. We've learned a lot about what causes lung scarring or fibrosis, which has made possible the new antifibrotic drugs which slow the progress of the disease and recently have been found to extend life. There are currently, we have currently have two antifibrotic treatments, but there are many more in the pipeline. We find that COVID-19 has focused attention even more on lung fibrosis and recent advances in related fields like genetics and artificial intelligence are enabling a far deeper understanding of the causes of the different types of pulmonary fibrosis, which hopefully will lead to new treatments. All in all, I think it's a really exciting time and hopeful time to be involved in pulmonary fibrosis research. Our aim in this series of webinars is to inform patients and their families about the latest advances in research and to discuss what these might mean for the IPF, the, or rather the pulmonary fibrosis community. Our speakers will do their best to present their ideas in plain language and without using too many technical words or jargon. Um, that'll be a first. <laughs> Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Richard Allen of the University of Leicester, who's going to talk to us about his research on the genetics of IPF. Richard is an APF Mike Bray Research Fellow, and his research is being financed by the charity. As you know, almost all APF's income comes from the pulmonary fibrosis community across the UK. Without you, our wonderful supporters and fundraisers, none of this would be possible. So I'd like to say a very sincere thank you to all of you. Richard started out as a mathematics and statistics student, <coughs> student at the University of York, but did his PhD on, at the University of Leicester, where he applied his skills to the field of genetics. He is rapidly becoming one of the leading researchers on the genetics of IPF, and recently led the largest ever genetic study of IPF. Richard is gonna talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have questions for 20 to 25 minutes. Some of you have already submitted questions. If others would like to, please do so using the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen. The Q and A feature, please do not use the chat function because we'll be using that for something else. Um, Richard has kindly agreed to write a brief note afterwards, summarizing his answers to all of your questions, which we will put onto the APF website. So if your question is not answered live tonight, you'll find out the answer to it later on. So Richard, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to speak on your topic of does DNA hold the key to understanding pulmonary fibrosis? Over to you, Richard. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, so as Steve said, I'm a researcher based at the University of Leicester, uh, and my research is funded by Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis. So tonight I shall talk about uh, the genetics research that we do, sort of why we do it and how we do it. Uh, so I shall just share my screen. Yeah. Okay, so sort of starting with what pulmonary fibrosis is. Well, when there is damage in your body, your body obviously needs to repair that damage. So what it does is it is it, it deposits a tiny bit of scar tissue to fix that damage, which is a bit like uh, the body putting a plaster over the damage to fix it. In pulmonary fibrosis, there's a buildup of this scar tissue in the lungs, uh, but we don't really know why this is. And in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we don't know what's actually causing this to happen. And then this scarring builds up and it causes the lungs to become stiffer and stiffer, which makes it harder to breathe. So as I said, we don't really know what's causing uh, IPF or PF, but we do know that genetics plays quite a key role in it. So just to sort of go through what genetics is, uh, DNA is the 
sort of instructions that make us who we are. So it determines everything there is about us. So it determines how tall we are, what eye colour we have. It can even determine what risk of certain diseases we have. And all DNA is, is this long string of chemical bases, which we can label as A, C, T and G. So here on this person, uh, on the left is what the DNA looks like. So it forms this double helix structure. And then at the first base, we have an A, the second base, a C, a T, and a C, and so on. And we have two copies of our DNA. So we inherit one from our mother and one from our father. So that would look something like this. And for the most part, this is the same. So this person here has an A on both, on both sides. Uh, so we call this person AA in this position. At the second position, they have a C on both, and this carries on. At the third, they have a T on both. But we can get places where there are differences. So, for example, this person here has a G on one of their chromosomes and a T on the other chromosome, whereas some people may have a G on both and some people might have a T on both. So this person here we'd call GT, because they've got a G on one chromosome and a T on the other. Other people would call GG if they had a G on both. And uh, people who had a T on both, we'd call them TT. Uh, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about genes. And all genes are, are sections of the DNA that contain, that contain the instructions to make a protein. So once we've identified these genetic variants, i.e. where we can have these changes in the DNA, we may want to say, well, is this associated with a risk of a disease? For example, pulmonary fibrosis. So the way we would do that is collect the DNA of lots of people who have pulmonary fibrosis and compare that to the DNA of people who don't have pulmonary fibrosis. So if we do that in this example, on the left you can see the people without pulmonary fibrosis. You can see a lot of people have Gs on both chromosomes. Whereas when we look at the people with pulmonary fibrosis, we see a lot more people with this T base. Uh, and so suggest that this T base is actually quite important in terms of risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And once we identify these genetic variants that are associated with risk of a disease, we can then try and work out what they do and how that is increasing your risk of a disease. And this is actually a real example. So uh, at this position, people with a T are five times more likely to develop IPF. And as I said, once we identify these genetic variants, we can then try and work out what those variants do. And what this one does is it controls a gene called MUC5B. And what that does is it produces mucus in the airways. And what we think is happening is that people with this T, they produce more mucus and that impairs how well the lungs can defend themselves, which is what leads to the damage in the lungs and what eventually leads to the scarring. However, this isn't the only part of the DNA that's associated with pulmonary fibrosis. So what we do at Leicester are these studies called genome-wide association studies. So in these studies, we don't just look, look at one genetic variant, we look at millions of them across the whole of the DNA. So we do that by comparing the DNA of people with pulmonary fibrosis to the DNA of people without pulmonary fibrosis. And to do this, we need lots and lots of people. And so obviously we can't run these analyses just sort of on our laptops that we have, but on the right, is a picture of the computer that we have to use to do these analyses. So this is a supercomputer based at the University of Leicester. And what we do is we can access this remotely, which has actually been really handy over the past few months where even though we've been working at home, we've still, we've still been able to carry on with this research uh, as we can access this remotely. And by doing these genome-wide association studies, we've been able to show that genes are involved in lung defense, cellular aging, uh, how well cells can stick together and also signaling that tells the body to deposit scar tissue are all important processes when it comes to risk of IPF. So uh, the obvious question now is, so that's all very nice, but what is the point of this? Well, the point of any sort of medical research should obviously be to try and find a cure. And these studies can help in drug development in three ways. So firstly, if we identify a gene, that's associated with risk of a disease, we can then work out what protein that makes. And if we can identify the protein, then we may be able to develop drugs that target that protein. Secondly, uh, these studies may also show that certain diseases are similar to each other. So if we find that there's an overlap, a genetic overlap between 
pulmonary fibrosis and some other trait where there is currently a treatment already in use, we may be able to repurpose that treatment to use for pulmonary fibrosis. And finally, we may also find subsets of patients where drugs are actually more likely to be effective based on what their DNA is. So for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on some studies that we've done for IPF, but that doesn't mean that these, this isn't relevant for other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. And in fact, recent evidence suggests that drugs for IPF may actually be effective for other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. So by doing these genetic studies of IPF, that obviously helps with IPF research, but it may also help the research into other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. So now I'll talk about a genetic study that we did for IPF risk. Uh, so previously, there was three of these genome-wide association studies of IPF. So these are known as the UK, the Chicago, and the Colorado study. So what we did was we collected all of the uh, people who were involved in these studies and sort of combined them into one really large analysis. And that way, we were able to compare the DNA of over 2,500 people with IPF to 8,500 people without IPF. And from this, we were able to study 10 million genetic variants. And where we found these differences, we took those forward to study in two additional studies, known as US and Genentech, to make sure that these are actually genuinely associated with IPF risk. So in total, we were able to compare the DNA of 4,000 people with IPF to around 20,000 people without IPF. And what, this, what we found was that there, we found three new parts of the genome that are associated with risk of IPF. Uh, and these map to the genes KIF15, MAD1L1, and DEPTOR. So KIF15 and MAD1L1 are known as spindle assembly genes. And this is a biological process that we didn't know before was associated with IPF risk. But the third one, DEPTOR, is actually really interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So going back to what I was saying earlier, we know that uh, signaling is important in at the, the deposit of scar tissue. And there's a specific process called TGF beta signaling, which is quite important in pulmonary fibrosis. So if we imagine here in the center of the screen that these are uh, lung cells, and in the middle you can see that there's this black box, so where there's been some damage to this lung. In the body, there are proteins that go around and they identify where there is damage and where the body needs to deposit the scar tissue. So going back to the sort of plaster analogy I, went, I said earlier, the body will then deposit this scar tissue to fix that damage. And then there are also these other proteins that tell the body to stop depositing the scar tissue. So we can always think of these sorts of proteins on the left as accelerator proteins, and these uh, proteins on the right as sort of brake proteins. So the accelerators tell the body to deposit the scar tissue, and the brakes tell the body to then stop. A couple of years ago, we performed a genetic study and we identified the ACAP13 gene as important in IPF risk. And what this does is it means that you produce more of these accelerator proteins. So there's this damage in the body. And although you have these proteins telling the body to stop depositing the scar tissue, because you have lots of these proteins, these accelerator proteins, the body keeps depositing the scar tissue and that's what leads to the stiffening of the lungs. In the latest study we did, as I said, we identified this gene called DEPTOR. So the body identifies that there's damage, it deposits the scar tissue, but what DEPTOR does is it stops these break proteins being produced. So now there's nothing telling the body to stop depositing the scar tissue. And that's why we get this build of the scar tissue that leads to the stiffening of the lungs. So again, sort of, is this actually useful? Well, it is actually quite exciting because there are, there are possible drug targets in both of these accelerator and brake proteins. So actually this sort of research is leading to an avenue that could lead to a new treatment for IPF. So in summary, this is the largest genetic study of IPF to date. Uh, we managed to investigate 10 million genetic variants in 4,000 people with IPF and compared that to 20,000 people without IPF. And we found three new parts of the genome that are, that are associated with an increased risk of IPF. So now, has this actually led to anything? Well, when we sort of published the studies, we made, we sort of said, 
that anyone who wanted the results for all 10 million variants that, that they that would make these results freely available and these are all of the institutions that have contacted us to get access to those results to use in their research so as you can see we've been contacted by lots of academic uh, institutions from across europe america canada and china but i think probably sort of most excitingly is that of 10 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world six of them contacted us to ask if they could have these results to use in their drug development programs which i think sort of it highlights how useful these these studies are but it's also quite reassuring that actually these drug companies are taking pulmonary fibrosis seriously and actually trying to find cures uh, these are obviously quite large studies and i didn't do this all on my own so these are all of the collaborators across the uk who were involved in this study uh, and in red i've highlighted the individuals who are uh, associated with uh, action for pulmonary fibrosis so myself and phil uh, are both fellows funded by APF and Gisley, Simon and Helen are all uh, trustees at APF. But this also wasn't just a UK based uh, study and actually there was researchers from across the world who contributed and these are all of the international collaborators who actually helped with this study. Which I think also highlights just how sort of collaborative the APF research community is. So, so what are we doing now and what is APF funding? So what we've done so far is we've shown that changes in your DNA can affect your risk of getting IPF or just pulmonary fibrosis. And so far we've sort of investigated genetic variants that are quite commonly found in the general population. But that does sort of leave some questions that we haven't answered yet. So as I'm sure most of you are aware that people's experiences of IPF are very different. And some people can have a very progressive form of the disease, whereas some people have a more stable, sort of slowly progressive form. But we don't really know why that is. We also can't predict at the moment who is going to exhibit this progressive versus slowly progressive form of the, the disease. And we also haven't looked as much about our sort of genetic variants that are less common or rare in the, in the general population. So the work funded by APF is essentially trying to answer those questions. So I'm performing these genetic analyses again, but rather than compare the DNA of people with IPS against those who don't, we're performing the analyses comparing the DNA of people with very progressive IPS against those with a slowly progressive, progressive form of IPS. Secondly, we're trying to build models to predict who will have a progressive form of IPS. Uh, and uh, it's also, we're also building a resource that will allow us to study these rare genetic variants. And the good thing about this is that not only will this help in this research, but this, this resource will also be made available uh, to other researchers. Uh, so this could actually help contribute to genetic research of IPF for years and years to come. Uh, and this isn't the only thing that we're doing at Leicester. So this is the sort of team at Leicester, which is run by uh, Louise Wayne. Uh, so we're not just looking at IPF, but also trying to understand genetic risk factors of other types of pulmonary fibrosis, trying to understand why men and women have different experiences with IPF. Uh, when I've said that we've identified the, these genetic, uh, these genes are associated with IPF or pulmonary fibrosis, do they work on their own or do they work together in different combinations that increase your risk of pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, and also looking to see whether genes that affect uh, how we deal with infections from bacteria and virus, whether that also affects how we deal with IPF. So just to sort of summarise, uh, by using the DNA from thousands of people, we can identify biological processes that may be causing pulmonary fibrosis. And as we know the biological processes, we may be able to try and target these processes to, de to develop cures. And there is lots of research happening out there, which gives us hope that hopefully we can find a cure soon. So a question I get asked quite often is how do I get involved in research? So the easiest way is to ask your doctor if they're recruiting for fibrosis research and if not ask them why not, because I think they should be. Uh, there are also two online sources uh, where you can search for clinical trials that are currently happening. So all clinical trials are registered on clinicaltrials.gov and then the EU IPFF clinical trial finder specifically has pulmonary fibrosis trials uh, in the EU. Uh, 
And I think this one's slightly easier to use than the clinicaltrials.gov website. Uh, as I said, lots and lots of people are involved in this research, but this is a special thanks to Louise, Gisley, Imre, Shufan, Justin, Jose Miguel, Carlos and David Schwartz. Uh, and obviously thank you to all of the funders, NIHR and the British Lung Foundation. Particular thanks to APF for the funding and also just their support in general. And the main thanks obviously goes to the people who agreed to take part in these studies because we wouldn't be able to do these studies uh, if people didn't agree to take part. And thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much indeed, Richard. Are you hearing me now? Sorry, it's fine, yeah. Um, that was really, yes. really stimulating talk. And we've got a load of questions coming in already. Um, first question for you. Um, as someone with a few family members who are affected by IPF, is it possible to be tested for IPF risk genes? Yes, so, so you can be, so you could get your sort of genetics measured and to identify these genes. What we find is that actually a lot of people in the general population do carry these risk genetic variants. Uh, and actually the most people who do carry these genetic variants won't go on to develop pulmonary fibrosis. So we're not at a stage yet where we could sort of predict who would get pulmonary fibrosis and who wouldn't. We're only being able to identify genes that can increase your risk. Okay, so I, I was going to ask a question from my own experience. I had what I believe was the, the general, the sporadic kind of IPF. I've got three kids in their 30s. What's the likelihood that they might get IPF or be yeah, present and find they have IPF in later life? And the same answer, I guess. Yeah, so obviously because you will share some of your genetics with your sort of kids and grandkids, they may be more likely to have a risk variant, but their actual risk of pulmonary fibrosis will still be quite low. Okay. Um, second question from that question was the first one was actually from Becky Lang, one of our trustees as well. Next one from Claire Beckett from the um, Patworth group. How does the research mentioned tie in with the 100,000 genome project in the UK where IPF and PF may be awaiting results of no novel genetic mutations? Yes, so I think 1,000 genomes uh, tends to look more at sort of the familial form of IPF where they're looking for sort of these rare genetic uh, variants, whereas the sort of research we described here is looking more at this sporadic form of IPF in the general population. So we're looking more for these sort of common genetic changes uh, to try and identify sort of these general biological pathways that may increase your risk. Yeah, I guess that but, comes but down... Certain, certainly the thousand gene... Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I guess yeah, it's certainly the thousand people... genus project. And... Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> so, I'm so, really sorry. Yeah. So, 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 so sort of cohorts like thousand genus could definitely sort of help contribute to this, uh, to these sort of research projects that we do. Yeah. I think sorry, there are... I know, <laughs> here we go, sorry. I know there are some from, from friends who have... Um, uh, yeah, familial IPF or it's in the family, they're worried that they can't be told what gene is mutating. They're often told you have familial, but nobody can tell them exactly what the gene is. And are we getting any closer to that where we can be sure to identify the genetic mutations involved in familial IPF? Yeah, so it, it can be a little bit harder with familial IPF just because of the sort of numbers of people we can study. So as I was saying, in sort of the studies we do, we get thousands and thousands of people and compare their DNA. But obviously, if you're just looking in a family, you can own, you have a limited number of people whose DNA you can actually look at. So it can be a lot harder to find these genetic changes. OK, thanks. And another question from uh, Michael Donoghue. Um, does your study help explain why the two antifibrotic medicines currently available appear to work well for a year or so? and then suddenly they become ineffective. I'm not sure whether that's everybody's experience, but it's clearly Michael's experience. Yeah, yeah so probably, like surely probably not, mainly because of obviously your DNA is fixed uh, at birth and will be fixed throughout your sort of whole life. Uh, you can have other sort of changes, so, for example, parts can attached to your DNA and that may 
change how you sort of respond to different treatments. But uh, the sort of stuff we're looking at is just these base changes uh, which are fixed throughout life. So that probably wouldn't actually say why we see this differential response to treatment over time. Okay, there's a couple of questions about um, acid reflux and mucus. Is there a link between all of what you're talking about and acid re reflux? Uh, people are saying great presentation, by the way, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also mucus production, the MUP5B gene. I mean, are these things in any way related? Do we, do we know yet? Because the, you know, both we all, we, with IPF and with PF, we all suffer a lot from mucus and a large number of people also do suffer with, with acid reflux. Yeah, so to, as we know that sort of acid reflux can increase your risk of uh, IPF, how, how all of these sort of factors work together, so how mucus and acid reflux work together, we don't really know yet. And certainly sort of from the genetic side of stuff, the genetics research we probably haven't seen as much that explains the acid reflux as we have opposed to the mucus which is quite a clear signal in this one gene where we know what's actually causing this increased mucus production. Okay a couple of questions. But there is certainly lots of research to sort of try and understand all this. Great thanks. A lot, uh, two questions from Robert and Becky on the same subject. Have you managed to identify whether the male or female, well first question is why is there a difference between male and females in IPF? Um, in incidence, you know, it's roughly two thirds men, one third women. And have you managed to identify whether the male or female genes are more likely to pass on a higher risk of IPF? Do we know the, is there a genetic yeah. reason there or is it? So again, we're not entirely certain at the moment. Uh, the, the increase of prevalence of IPF and pulmonary fibrosis in men uh, it's probably partly explained by non-genetic factors. So, for example, certain jobs mean you may be more at risk of pulmonary fibrosis, for example, like mining or carpentry, jobs that may be more common for men to have historically. Uh, certainly the, the research that we're doing in the group at the moment that's looking at these differences between males and females has identified a couple of parts of the DNA that are actually interesting and suggest that there could be some genetic reason as to why there are these differences. But these, this research is still fairly sort of early stage, so we don't fully understand what those DNA changes are doing at the moment. And we also need to sort of replicate them to miss, just to make sure that they are genuine signals. So we don't know yet, but hopefully soon. Okay. That's great. And <laughs> a question kind of related to that is from Lauren Rubin. What can cause your DNA to change um, in a way that would increase your risk of IPF? So why do those yeah. numbers change, those letters change? Yeah, so, so we inherit, the, so our, our DNA we inherit at birth. So we inherit half our DNA from our mum, half our, our DNA from our dad, and that's fixed throughout our lives. Uh, you can get sort of random mutations through your life. Uh, so there are certain things that can increase those random mutations, such as sort of smoking may cause certain cells to develop these random mutations but most of these genetic changes you have from birth and and we sort of need those differences because it's those it's those small genetic changes is what makes us all different so that's why me and steve look look slightly different is because we have these slight differences in our dna we've both got the same beards mate but... <laughs> <laughs> okay um and peter shaw asks you 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 said ask that um I sorry, Steve. I've lost sound. Hey, are you hearing me? Uh, yes, I can hear you again now. Sorry. Okay, you can hear. Okay, fine. Now, Peter Shaw is saying um, you said we should ask our doctor about clinical trials and research. What doctor do you mean? Do you mean doctors at specialist hospitals or GPs? Uh, well. Um, Everyone, I assume, sort of, ev I think everyone should be trying to sort of recruit people to try and be involved in this research. Certainly, sort of, specialist doctors at hospitals will probably know a little bit sort of more about research, but I think every, ev all parts of sort of uh, healthcare should be trying to promote sort of medical research. So I'd ask everyone. <laughs> okay, I think the, I mean, the answer, certainly, I think if you're in a general hospital, 
for most of your care. I mean, the research may or may not be taking place at the general hospital. Um, they mostly, clinical trials are centered on 10 or 12 of the specialist centers in, in England at least. So I think the best thing to do is to get your, your talk to your consultant at your general hospital, get them to refer you to one of their colleagues at a specialist center who, who might be able to, to help you with that. But APF is always here, contact us and we can help you know, put you in touch with people. Um, a really interesting question here from Anonymous, um, which is, I understand that IPF and PF and cystic fibrosis are fundamentally different diseases, but do we know if CF carriers are at greater risk of developing IPF, PF? In other words, have the same, some of the same genetic underpinnings. Yeah, so, so cystic fibrosis is actually quite a different disease. So, <clears throat> As I was saying, we've identified lots of parts of the DNA that's associated with pulmonary fibrosis risk. With cystic fibrosis, there's one gene. Uh, it's called CFTR. Yeah. And essentially, if you have changes in that one gene uh, on, on both sets of your chromosomes, so both the set that you inherited from your mum and from your dad, you will develop a cystic fibrosis. So from that aspect, it's actually quite a different genetic. So genetically, it's very different to... Uh, PF and IPF because it's just this one gene rather than a complex disease which is sort of affected by lots of different genes and environment that work together in this complex way which pulmonary fibrosis is. Uh, so I don't, I don't actually know if cystic fibrosis uh, patients are more likely to get pulmonary fibrosis but certainly from a genetic perspective they're quite different. Yeah we could check that and put it into the note that you write afterwards yeah? With one dog. And yeah, somebody was, was talking about the um the aging effect on the lungs, you know, cell, cell aging, premature aging of um is something associated with IPF. Has this has this got genetic underpinnings? That's from Jeff Gardner. Uh, yeah, so so uh, when we look at these parts of the DNA that we uh, know are associated with IPF. What we find is that uh, quite a few of them land in these genes called telomere genes. So your your DNA is a, is a bit like a shoestring, uh, and at the end of sort of your shoestring, you have those sort of plastic caps, which sort of protect the the shoestring. Uh, and your DNA is actually quite similar to that in that there's these protective caps at the end called telomeres. Uh, and what we find is that people with shorter telomeres are more likely to develop pulmonary fibrosis and actually a lot of uh, quite a few of the genetic changes that we find associated with pulmonary fibrosis they're involved in maintaining these uh, these protective caps these these telomeres and as you get older then your telomeres become shorter which possibly explains why you're more at risk of IPF and PF when you're older is because we have this aging process Right. which is based on these protective caps and a lot of that is regulated by our genes. Great, so it all comes down to the same thing. Claire Beckett again, does your data suggest patients have more than one genetic mutation which leads to an increased risk of IPF or PF? Is there a common cluster of affected genes? Yeah, so so most, so actually most people in the general population who don't have PF will actually carry a couple of these uh, risk genetic variants. Uh, and then people who do have IPF, we, we find tend to carry a few more of these risk, risk variants. So people are more likely to carry a number of these risk variants. We've looked for sort of clusters uh, and there doesn't, we haven't sort of identified any yet, but that's sort of part of what the fellowship that's being funded by APF is actually trying to look for is can we identify these clusters of genes that are working together and identify sort of subtypes of disease. Great. Now that's really you know, a very important thing to do. Um, we've got a question that I can think I can probably answer is, um, do we know how much research is being undertaken into PF associated with long COVID? Um, and the answer is that one of our trustees, Gisley Jenkins, uh, professor at Nottingham, is one of the leading researchers in this field in, in the UK. We still, um, there's a, the jury is still out on the extent to which serious respiratory problems will continue and whether patients will get progressive pulmonary fibrosis or not. But based on what happened before with SARS and MERS, the two 
viruses that were around in the early 2000s, um, there's a strong suspicion that there will be a number of people who, who are, and that we, we are part of the, um, the long COVID study also being uh, led out of the University of Leicester. So there's a lot going on that. And that. Elaine, if you wanted to know more about that, please um, you know, get in touch with me and I can, um, I can point you in the right direction. Um, uh, Lee, Lisa Stockton says, um, my husband has been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which has affected his lungs and has been told he has the start of lung fibrosis. My dad is an IPF sufferer. Does this mean that my children are at greater risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis? That was Lisa. Uh, yes, yeah, so, as I sort of said earlier, we have, so as you pass on your genetics, you do, you may pass on certain variants that do increase uh, the risk of pulmonary fibrosis slightly, but it doesn't mean that any of your kids or grandkids or great grandkids will actually develop pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, but certainly you can pass on risk uh, variants. Uh, it, so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, do we know in, I mean, with rheumatoid arthritis, I understand that about 10% of RA sufferers go on to get an ILD, an interstitial lung disease, like your pulmonary fibrosis. Not all of it necessarily progressive, but some of it is. Um, do we understand the genetic reasons why why some yeah so so not so not really at the moment as as sort of a lot of the research we've done certainly at Leicester has been more around IPF but we're sort of trying to expand into other interstitial lung diseases so that's part of what uh, Louise Wayne is leading is trying to understand this rheumatoid arthritis interstitial lung yeah. diseases and try and compare different forms of pulmonary fibrosis to understand how they overlap how they're related to each other and then that will hopefully give us a better idea as to what the link is between the different types of pulmonary fibrosis. Great and John Conway, a really interesting question, what is the process of identifying target genes to study in pulmonary fibrosis, your IPF, familial IPF? In other words, you know, you do your, your thing, you come up with a whole long list of genes that might possibly be associated with IPF. How do you decide which ones to look into? Um, and also, who yeah. do you do it with? So, <laughs> yeah, so, so a lot. So, what we, so when we identify these genetic changes where there are differences between people with pulmonary fibrosis and people without, uh, we then obviously have to try and work out then what gene that acts through. So, some of these changes sit in the gene, so they change what protein is made, uh, and others may affect sort of the expression of the gene, so how much of the protein is made. So that way we can identify potentially interesting genes. And then we do a lot of work with the University of Nottingham. So uh, with the APF trustee, Gizzy Jenkins, and they do a lot of sort of lab follow-up where they can sort of make changes in different sort of animal models to try and see the effect of changing these genes and whether that does increase your risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And then hopefully trying to identify ways to then treat those changes. Okay, thank, thanks, Richard. Um, an inter another question related back a little bit to the RA one is um, Carol Saunders. I've been told that my pulmonary fibrosis is autoimmune driven, possibly, and excuse my pronunciation, Schwarben's syndrome. Um, is this due to genetics? Yeah, there uh, yeah so, I, yeah, so I, I, I don't know is the answer to that. We are trying to expand our research, as I say, to try and cover more forms of pulmonary fibrosis and hopefully in a few years there's, there's certainly lots of research at the moment being done into other forms of pulmonary fibrosis that aren't IPF and I think we're learning a lot more about these different forms of, of pulmonary fibrosis there all the time. Yeah and um, well, a question back to you again. Um, uh, okay uh, I'm, just, I'm reading a large number of questions <laughs> about 16 or so. Um, this one does Richard have any idea as to why people some people only live a short time after diagnosis. You know, there's people who are rapid progressors, as they're called, and some survive for many years. I mean, I had a close a friend who sadly passed away six months after a clear x-ray, and I lived for eight years um, before I was becoming seriously ill. So there's big differences, aren't there, among the population? Yeah, so, so essentially that's all the research that APF is funding is to try and answer that question. 
So we've done some of these analyses to sort of look at progressive versus non -progressive or less progressive IPF. And what we're seeing is that the genetics of disease progression might actually be quite different to the genetics that drive disease risk. Uh, we don't fully understand it all yet. Uh, we need to do lots of sort of follow-up studies to try and understand these changes that we're finding. So we're sort of starting to do that research, but it's still sort of early days at the moment. Great. I mean, could I ask you a question as well? When do you think we're going to understand the genetics of pulmonary fibrosis well enough so that we can design precise treatments tailored to individual patients' needs? Do you think we're ever going to be able to tell people when they're youngsters, avoid those environmental triggers mm -hmm. because there's a risk that they're going to give you pulmonary fibrosis? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I don't know. So I, I think sort of... Uh, it may be difficult for us to, because of how rare or relatively rare pulmonary fibrosis is, it may be difficult to sort of predict who is, who is going to get IPF. Uh, certainly from the perspective of sort of personalised medicine and sort of targeting treatment, hopefully sort of, sort of that, that's sort of where we're sort of working towards. It may be a few years and sort of drug development can always feel a bit slow. Uh, but we sort of are working towards that and there is studies at the moment that are looking at the genetics of clinical trials and actually finding that your genetic makeup can change how well you respond to a certain treatment. So there is the research being done to better understand if certain drugs are going to be more effective in certain people and certain drugs will be better in other people. Uh, so hopefully we will get to that stage at some point, but as to exactly when, I don't know. Yeah, another a friend of mine in her early 40s, um, she, her mother died of IPF in her, or familial PF in her 50s, and I don't think she actually presented with the disease until she was about 50. So it appears like the disease in familial is getting earlier in subsequent generations. Is that something that is noted in genetics? Uh, it's, it's not something that I've read, but I can certainly look. Yeah, it's called procession, procession or something. Okay. Where somebody once said to me, it's like the body trying to get you to have the disease early enough that you don't have children. How to get rid of the, <laughs> you know, you die from the disease before you have children so that you don't keep it in the, the gene pool. But whether that's just um, that was <laughs> a doctor, doctor, but you can't know. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so other question. Um, there's a number of questions about the inheritance. Um, due to COVID, are government putting extra funding now into IPF studies and research? Are you optimistic once uh, grant finishes that you'll well, get funded? I, I, I think certainly sort of like the, the, the smallest of silver linings of, of all of this sort of, of the coronavirus pandemic is that at least it's sort of finally showing government that it is worth investing in lung research, which is not been well invested in in the in the past so hopefully there is more investment now in lung research in general uh so hopefully that as i say a small small silver lining may be that it may actually help pulmonary fibrosis in the research in the long run by leading to more investment great thanks and david reese from uh, down in swansea planetly says in theory i assume we may not be only be looking at stopping the scar buildup but in time, possibly reversing scarring. Is that too optimistic? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I suppose the first step will be to try and stop it. So the current drugs only slow down the scarring uh, progression. So the next step will be trying to sort of stop any more scarring occurring, and then hopefully we will one day find a cure where we can actually reverse some of the scarring. Uh, but certainly I think the, the stopping of the deposits of scar tissue should hopefully be achievable and hopefully we can actually find a cure and reverse the scarring as well. Um, there's a number of questions where people are, because I know you probably won't be able to necessarily answer and you may have done already, but mm. my husband died in 2000, his brother died in 2016, his sister's now been diagnosed, as is the other sibling in the family. Um, is, as the other sibling in the family is likely to have it, what about my children? Yeah, so it's probably an unanswerable question, isn't it? But yeah, so so we don't know. Obviously, as you have familial uh, fibrosis, which can run in families, 
Uh, but also with pulmonary fibrosis, is we think it's this sort of shared interplay between environment and genetics. So where genetically susceptible individuals have some exposure that causes damage to the lungs, uh, which then leads to the scarring. So when you also look in families, you also have, may have shared environmental exposures as well. So it can also be a bit difficult sort of disentangling the difference between shared environment and shared genetics. Great, thanks. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, again, another one from Jeff Gardner. Um, Jeff asks, um, which I, I might have a go answer as well. Some of the drugs which we take have helped COVID sufferers. Is this true? Uh, I think. I mean, at one sense, the news tonight said that um, you know steroids, ordinary steroids, which a number of people, not with IPF generally, but with other forms of PF, do take, um, is now apparently being approved for use in COVID. Um, it was on the news this evening. But the question about whether our, in, you'd think that antifibrotic drugs we take should then be useful for um, you know, COVID patients who are getting fibrosis. And I understand, having discussed this recently with, with Gisley Jenkins, that the, or the jury is absolutely out on that because both of the drugs we take, perfenidone and intednib, have side effects. And those side effects may well you know, have... Uh, impacts that we don't yet know on COVID and the, the progress of COVID as a disease. So there's a, there's a feeling that until there have been clinical trials testing nintednib and pervenidone with COVID patients, it's not possible to say that they're usable or not. That's my understanding anyway. Um, do the drugs that we currently use, again, pervenidone and nintednib, um, in trials target specific, sorry, do they target specific genes? identified from IPF research? Yeah, so, so, so those drugs were licensed before we'd done any of these studies. Uh, so I think it's not entirely clear which processes the two drugs are targeting. I think they both target certain growth factor pathways, uh, which is similar to that TGF beta signaling pathway that I was talking about earlier. So it's a similar process and I think they target those. Uh, but we haven't identified sort of the, the, the drugs we currently have don't target any of the genetic signals that we've identified. Okay, I mean, nintendum is, what, nintendum is what they call a kinase inhibitor. Um, I think with perfenidone, it's less clear how it works, but I think there is a clear, um, it's inhibiting some protein production or something, but we'll, we'll make sure that yes, goes so <laughs> afterwards okay yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult because the, I mean I should have explained at the beginning that you know Richard as a geneticist and a mathematician is not a medical doctor and so some <laughs> of these questions it would be wrong for it's certainly wrong for me to answer them as I have probably but it would be wrong as well to, <laughs> to ask Richard to um given that IPF is so difficult to diagnose in the early stages of the disease do you know um whether the non-IPF patient in your study are you actually sure that non-IPF patients in your study don't have IPF or aren't going to go on to develop it? Yeah, so, so we can't say for certain that all of those people won't go on to develop IPF. Given how sort of uncommon IPF is, we can assume that certainly most people won't. So hopefully, so, so we use those sort of non-IPF people as sort of a representation of sort of the general population. And we hope that they are actually quite representative, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There could be a few people in there who either have undiagnosed IPF or go on to develop it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work going on in, in parallel to genetics on what are called interstitial lung abnormalities. You know, now that we have these fantastic um, CT scans, much more powerful than they were when I was diagnosed 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, the ones we have now can really identify patterns in lungs much better. Um, and they're looking at very early stages. And I, I believe something like 15% of the population have something called an, like an interstitial lung abnormality of some kind, but very few of us go on to develop fibrosis. So the question is, is it gonna be possible to, for, to identify what causes that, um, those to progress and those not? And that probably again is a genetic question, quite likely, yeah? Yeah, so so, so there, there was a recent study uh, in, so, so similar to what uh, we did here, where they compared people with these uh, abnormalities to people who don't have these interstitial lung abnormalities. 
uh, did this sort of genome-wide study and identified genes associated with these abnormalities. And there is actually some overlap with IPF. So we are sort of starting to look at that interplay between these early markers of lung damage and actual uh, well-characterized pulmonary fibrosis. And we are seeing some genetic similarities. Interesting question here. Is IPF or pulmonary fibrosis more prevalent in colder climates? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure. It, it does vary a lot by sort uh, by ethnicity. So IPF is a lot more common in sort of European populations, and that may partly be down to genetics as well. So the the sort of the mucus uh, producing variant that I was talking about earlier, that's actually quite common in uh, people of European ancestry. But if you look at sort of if you look in populations sort of African or South Asian ancestry, then that, that uh, genetic mutation doesn't really exist and everybody has this sort of GG uh, pairing. So there are certainly differences geographically in IPF prevalence. So that might partly be down to the environment. So whether sort of colder climates is, is an effect maybe, but also sort of down to genetic change differences. Yeah, great. That's um, so much. There's a question which um, Lauren has asked about um, as so many IPF, so many with IPF originally suffered with acid reflux for many years prior to their diagnosis. Is there anything that can be taken for those with acid reflux to stop or reduce the progression of IPF? And should GPs be more aware of the long-term risks of acid reflux? I mean, I think if I could just answer this, but the, uh, the last question, undoubtedly GPs probably should be, but the question of whether acid reflux causes or exacerbates pulmonary fibrosis the jury is still absolutely out on. They're not sure which way the causality runs, if there is one. Does the fibrosis cause reflux or vice versa? Um, and there's a study which we are, APF is a joint partner in, um, centered on the University of East Anglia, which is looking at one of the anti, uh, you know, the, what they call protein pump inhibitor drugs, to see whether putting IPF patients on that drug progress more or less fast than patients who are not on the drug. And that's going to be taking place in 40 hospitals across the country. And we hope now, um, post COVID, that it will be possible to, to get that research started quite soon. So, um, uh, there's questions, Lynn says, that she, we better, we've got a couple more questions, I think. Lynn Cull says, I recently took part in a cell gene drug trial, which unfortunately was withdrawn just before the end due to COVID. I understand this was testing a drug working on protein pathways. Does this connect with your research at all? Uh, so so I, don't, I don't know uh, specifically which, uh, so if I'm honest, I don't know, uh, as I don't know sort of which uh, drug uh, that is. I know that there is certainly uh, drugs that, drug trials that are happening around this TGF beta signaling pathway uh, so which our sort of genetic research has sort of contributed to better understanding this pathway. So maybe, but I don't know if so. Great. And the question I asked before about your know, people in with getting the disease earlier in subsequent generations, Linda Stevens tells us, thanks for this, Linda, adult children getting the disease earlier in familial PF is called genetic anticipation and is noted with telomere disease. Um, I thought it's called genetic precession, but it's anticipation. So thanks very much for that. Um, and a final question from John Conway. Would there be any value in investigating possible correlations between progression with certain subgroups, such as familial PF? Uh, is that clear to you? Yeah, so I mean, certainly sort of, looking at subgroups of, of disease I think is is very valuable and, and sort of that is what the fellowship's trying to look at more closely at because if we can identify that there is sort of these different subtypes of disease then we may be able to identify drugs that target those different subtypes we may find that people in different subtypes respond differently to different drugs so actually I think understanding the differences between progressive familial uh, subtypes would be really important. Great. And final one from Claire Beckett. It's interesting that the majority of IPF sufferers are of older age. Thanks, Claire. Um, whereas those with a strong family history of PF uh, 
tend to have greater variation of age of onset. In other words, you can have it very early and you can have it later. Um, what might this suggest about the underlying genetic factors and or likely triggering events? Yeah, so, so I suppose one thing could be that if you know you have a family history of pulmonary fibrosis, then you may be sort of more aware of the signs and therefore may be diagnosed earlier. Uh, but certainly there are, we do see sort of differences between sporadic IPF and uh, familial IPF. Uh, so for example, with the sporadic IPF, these may be associated with aging. So for example, these telomeres, these protective caps at the end of the DNA. So it may be that uh, genes associated with sporadic IPF are more to do with aging, whereas the familial IPF, uh, the familial PF, sorry, uh, genes may have different processes that may occur earlier in life. Uh, so it could, it's probably definitely down to the genetics as to why we see these differences. And do they both need the environmental trigger? I mean, sporadic definitely needs often quite a strong environmental trigger, people think. Is that the case with familial too, or will familial happen anyway? Yeah, so I, I, I think we're not entirely certain. It's probably the best answer. I think it's still believed that you still need this. You still need something to trigger it. Uh, but we're not always entirely certain as to what that trigger is or if there actually has been one. But the sort of common belief seems to be that there is this interplay between environment, this environment exposure and then the genetic sort of response. Great. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Um, there are a number of questions on here about whether the um, film, the, the video will be available. And it will be, I understand, if, as long as it's been filmed well and it's not a problem, it will be on our website and it will be available for you. The slides will be there along with the presentation. But I think, Richard, if anybody wanted a, a PDF set of slides, we could probably provide those to people as well. Yes. Yeah? And yes, there are, so great, sir. And there are very many questions. Um, which have gone unanswered. Some of them I've, I've just missed because I thought they would be difficult for Richard to answer. They're ones that we maybe need to seek a doctor's ad advice on to answer. I hope I've made the right call there. Um, and, but we will be writing up an answer to all of the questions after the, um, after the uh, you know, probably a week, week or two. Um, so I'd like to thank Richard very much on behalf of all of us for his excellent talk. You know, stimulating such a, a great discussion tonight. And it's a really fantastic start to our webinar series. Thanks to all of you who answered questions. Um, 25 questions we had. I don't we think we managed to, we probably dealt with about 15, I should think. Um, and it's obviously a topic which is of great interest to all of us. Many, many people ask the same question about uh, what's the likelihood that my children are going to get it? Should they or should I be, be genetically screened? You know, and I think this is a, question where we don't quite know enough yet but probably in a f not many years time we're going to know a lot more and at that stage it may well be that that's a, it's a possible way forward so we hope that we might possibly get 80 or so tonight but it's absolutely amazing that we've had your 130 people with us for for most of the evening which is great it's amazing we hope you've all enjoyed the evening and you'll come to future events if there are particular topics that you, know, you would like to um, have us cover in these webinars, please let us know. Um, over the next year, we plan to have a number of these on different aspects of recent developments in pulmonary fibrosis research and what this means for patients and families. And we will advertise these on our website and via social media. Finally, I mean, I'd like to thank the APF team, especially Becca, who is um, behind the scenes on tonight, making sure that everything works well who is our head of our, our digital manager, for all her hard work in, in putting this together. Um, as I said, we've recorded the session. It'll be posted on our website. So if you want to, you can view it all again at your leisure. Um, so many, many thanks again, Richard, and many thanks to everybody for coming tonight. Thanks very much. Have a good evening.